بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أفضل المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني أو قولي وبعد once Abdullah ibn Abbas, the great companion and the great faqih, was approached by someone who asked him a question, a fiqhi kind question. Right? So he came to Abdullah ibn Abbas and he asked him this question. Yani, if a person commits murder, is there a tawbah for him? Is it possible for a person who committed the act of, you know, he killed someone, a murderer, can he repent? And he said, yes, indeed he can. Alhamdulillah. And then after a while, here comes another person to Abdullah ibn Abbas and he asked the same question. He looked to Abdullah ibn Abbas and he asked him, a person who committed the act of murder, is there a tawbah for him? Is there repentance for him? And he said, no, there is no repentance for him. And people were like, what's going on? Like two people came to you, they asked you the same question, but yet your answer to both of them were 180 degrees, completely different. Why? And he said, the first person, I looked unto him and in his eyes, I saw that he's a murderer. He committed an act of murder and he wanted to repent. So I gave him the fatwa, the fiqhi fatwa is what indeed there is tawbah for people that repent. The second person, on the other hand, I see in his eyes, he did not, he wants to kill. I know that he's upset and you know when you're upset against someone and you go to the, if I kill him, is there a way out for me? And he said, for that person, indeed I told him, I told him no because he wanted to kill. And the, the purpose I start with this is something that Ibn al-Qayyim says. Ibn al-Qayyim, this great scholar, would say the following statement. He would say, نصف الفقيه يسألك ما قلت والفقيه يسألك ما أردت He said, half a jurist, the half faqih, you know, the so-so faqih, would ask you, what did you say? Tell me again, he would judge your words. However, a full jurist, one that of good understanding of fiqh, would ask you, what do you mean? What do you intend? So when, whenever we speak, whenever even we ask questions, whenever we approach things, it is not sufficient to just take the outward words. Intent is very important. And that's what we were discussing, if you remember, in the class last time. And the topic was the intent of sharia, the purpose of sharia. That as we saw last time, uh, if, if, if you remember uh, what we said last time, very few statements. We said that our sharia, the purpose, sharia has a purpose, has an intent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an intent behind actions. And we said what was the purpose of sharia, what was the intent. We mentioned two things. Number one, ikhraj al-mukallaf an da'iyat hawah liyakuna abdad li mawlah. Is to free the servant from the yokes and the chains of his own desires and selves. So, uh, and self, an ego. So he can be a true servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one. And we said the other, if you remember last time, we said maqsad al-shari'ah, the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did he give sharia? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to worship him. Remember that? We said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَانِ And then we asked, but what does it mean? How do I know that, did I achieve that purpose or not? And scholars would say, the indication of this, لَمَّا يَكُونْ مَقْصَدِ الْعَبْدِ تَبَعًا لِمَقْصَدْ الْمَعْبُودِ the way you know that you're on this line is when you find that your intent, not your deeds, not only your deeds, your intent, your purpose, is in conformance, in conforming with following the intent and the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Small example, you see somebody doing something wrong, something haram, I go and speak to him, right? Fiqhi wise, that's good, that's al amru bil ma'roof wa nahi al munkar. Commanding what's good, forbidding what's evil, good. But this action which outwardly is good, what was the purpose? Why did you talk to him? If I find that what I, I talk with him and my purpose and my real desire and what's driving me is, I want him to repent. I want him to stop. I want, him, I want to bring him back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is in conformance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants because Allah told us in the Quran, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah wants you to, go, to come back to him. Allah wants to grant you repentance. If I find that not only my outward act, but my intention behind every act, my intent in life, my purpose in life, is in conformance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me, I've achieved ubudiyah. And now the question, as we said last time, is what does Allah want from me? Ma maqsad al-shari'ah? What is the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that is why we have shara. It, I, I can't find the intent of someone by me thinking. Uh, if, if I came here and I did this once with the youth, I came and uh, 
I brought a chocolate cake and placed it in front of me. And everyone was looking at the cake, right? Why did you bring this cake? There is a purpose. I, I placed a cake there. It's not haphazard. I have a purpose behind doing this. What is the fastest way to know the purpose? You can guess. You can say, hmm, he brought it. That is maybe after, after the class, we're going to eat it, right? That's his intent. Uh, maybe he brought it. He's going to say something about it. And you can keep thinking. But the fastest way for you to know is what? To ask me. Not to think so. Uh, Brother Hassan, why, why, did, why did you bring this cake? What? Why? What was your intent? What is the purpose of that? Similarly, for a believer, to find out the purpose of the Creator is, Ya Allah, tell me what was your... Why? What do you want from me? And that's the purpose of Sharia. To find out Allah's plan for us. Right? And we said last time, interestingly enough, how, not my words, the words of the scholar, the purpose and the intent of Sharia is what? Why do we have legislations and laws and all? The scholar said it in one sentence. تحقيق مصالح العباد في المعاش والمعاد is to establish what's good and what's beneficial for the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life and in the hereafter. So the purpose of Sharia, it has a purpose, it has a meaning, it has an intent, is to make this life and the hereafter good for us. And that was the main, basically, to draw to us what's beneficial and to ward off what's harmful. And this is the biggest, يعني, the, the main sentence we revolved around last time, that Sharia has an intent. And I'm summarizing. And last time we said, subhanAllah, like, the way to look at it, Sharia falls into two compartments, if you will. Two, two main sections. One, which has to do with that which is between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which has to do with matters of my soul, my heart. To have a pure heart, that's the purpose of Sharia. To guard my heart, that's the purpose of Sharia. That is why, don't look to something unlawful. That, that's a law, that's, that's legislation, right? It's haram to look to, why? You can ask why, what is the harm? I mean, one sister is not dressed properly out there, and I'm looking, I'm not doing any, any harm with my, and she's dressed that way, she's okay, I'm okay. What is the harm? But there is a harm to the heart. The purpose of this legislation of not looking, guard your heart, right? So it even in, yani, involves things, yani, some rulings, that has to do with even guarding our, our heart. That which has to guard the heart, that which is between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, acts of worship, fast to discipline the nafs, pray, do dhikr, dua to extract poverty, spend from your wealth, things that have to do with me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those are fixed. Those do not change. Why? If you remember we said that last time, the human soul, the human heart is constant. America, Egypt, 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, we're the same. Arrogance is the same. Envy is the same. Those acts, therefore, are tawqifiyya. When it comes to matters of ibadat, they're not going to change. Fasting, prayers, constant. However, on the other hand, the other compartment, which has to do with what? Me and the creation around me. The way I deal with the creation. Al-khalq. We said that changes with space and time. The way things are now with the internet and, and is very different than the way 2,000 years it was. Me and the creation in Egypt is different than here. Being a minority is different than being a majority. Living as a Muslim, Muslim in, my, uh, in a minority is different than Muslim in a majority country, right? The situation is different. The space is different. And therefore, those rulings, as we said last time, can actually change. And we, I know that that's a part that's surprising to many people. That laws, Islamic laws, Islamic uh, uh, fiqhi opinions, that has to do with mu'amalat can change. And that's what we spent most of last time, if you remember, discussing with practical examples. And we concluded with five things. Remember? We said the intent of Sharia. And those are really interesting. And yani, please keep them in your mind. Even when we discuss with non-Muslims, those are so important. That Sharia has an intent. And we said with all the rulings of mu'amalat, there are five main intents. They call them the five universals. Al-Kulliyat al-Khams. And notice how our scholars mention them. They don't mention them, those are particular to Islam. They say no. Those five things, any, any nation that needs, yani, that wants to make a civilization, have to deal with those five things. Not only as Muslims, they're called the universals. Period. For mankind as a whole. Not, not only us. Whole, you, five universal things that you have to take care of to establish any kind of human civilization. The number one intent of Sharia, the main purpose of Sharia, the number one thing that you do not mess up with, no matter what, the most important thing 
The intention of laws and an end is number one. Remember what it was? Religion. The right of freedom of religion. Defending the right of the human being to have freedom to choose whatever religion he wants and to protect that choice. So we never jeopardize this. This is so important. We don't do actions that jeopardize this. This is number one, the main intent of Sharia. Number two, to preserve human life. Laws are going to be legislated in such a way to preserve the value of human life. Human life is so important. It must not be wasted. Do not jeopardize human life as much as possible. It's number two. Remember what was number three? Intellect. The human intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us an intellect, mind. And of course, mind and heart. That those be sound is very important. Don't jeopardize that. Drugs, khamr, things that jeopardize that, therefore, you can't do that. That's the essence of it. And that's number three. Now, number four was what? Family and honor. The right to have a family. The right to have uh, uh, relations, marriage, divorce. Those are going to be legislated to protect this right of a human being. And number five is the right of property. The right of a human being to own and be safe in what he owns. And nobody takes it away from him. It should be guarded. That's oppression. Those are the five main universals that the Shari'i laws revolved around protecting. Now, before I continue, when, when we say that the Sharia has maqasid, therefore laws, the, the laws of Shara, it cares. It has an intent. It has a purpose. Honestly, I, I'm, I was very scared to speak about this topic. Why? Because I... I think people will immediately be yani, in, into two different opposite segments, two extremes. There is one extreme that would not like this whatsoever. What do you mean? That uh, the Prophet ﷺ might have, I find a hadith and then you don't implement it? Yes, and I give examples last time in the Mu'amalat section. Yes, it is, and I showed you how last time. No, 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 brother. Some people are very literal. They take the word of the Prophet ﷺ, here is the hadith, and it's out of goodwill, good intention, very good. Yani, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase them in, in their intent of following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But becoming so literal that you take the word out of context, out of purpose, out of why, what is, why was it legislated, and then implement it with the thought that if the Prophet says something, I implement it no matter what the consequences is. This is the right way. The Prophet said it, don't think. Don't think about the consequences. You do. And that's how it should be. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in strength in following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but that is not shara. That's incorrect. That's not the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I gave many examples last time. Ibn al-Qayyim himself says that. Ibn al-Qayyim, and you, who all of us know, who, a great scholar, he says his words, فَكُلِّ مَا فَعَلَهُ النَّبِيِّ لِحَاجَةٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ وَسَبَبٍ فَإِذَا ارْتَفَعَ السَّبَبٍ وَجَبَ أَنْ يَرْتَفَعَ ذَلِكَ الْحُكْمِ Anything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did for a reason, a wisdom, a specific need, must not be done if that need or cause or wisdom is removed. And you must do it if that cause or wisdom or need comes back. So finding one hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, I must have enough knowledge what was the context. It is very dangerous, as I pointed last time, to take one hadith without having any knowledge and implementing it blindly. Not focus. Sometimes, as I said, we have to take the consequences into account. Those five universals must be taken into account. One example I, I would give you, um, yani it's, uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but it, it helps bring the point into mind. Um, Mr. Panda, Panda Bear. And he goes to a restaurant and he's trying, you know, he, he wants to eat and he orders food and the, the waiter comes and brings him food and everything and the panda eats and eats and eats and he bill the bill. And here comes the waiter, like, you know, here's the bill, Mr. Panda, and he takes the bill, gets out a gun and shoots the, shoots the waiter. And people were like, what's going on? You shot him, you killed him. The police comes, an investigation. What did you do that? And he said, what, what's wrong? I did it by the book. I didn't do anything wrong. And they say, how can you say that? You shot the man. And they say, no, you told me to do so. I, I, I'm following the book. Nothing is wrong. How? And he said, bring me an encyclopedia. And they bring the encyclopedia. And he says, okay, here, read. Open. Panda. Right? And he tells them, read what's written. Panda eats, shoots, and leaves. The panda eats, shoots, and leaves. So how did he? He eats, shoots, and leaves. Literally, I didn't do anything wrong. He has good intentions. May Allah reward him. One of the benefits, Allah reward us with our intention. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for our intention. But being so literal, 
taking things out of context on one extreme is not good. And it's not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. There is intent behind the ruling specifically, the ones between me and the creation. One has to be very careful. And the main, one of the purpose, I, I said what I said last time with so many examples, is to bring into us this, we're so fast to give fatwa, so fast. One should be very scared. I, wallahi, personally, 10 years ago, in, in the 90s, in Columbus, Ohio, I entered the masjid and I found the mufti of Mecca. You know, the mufti, the grand mufti of Mecca is visiting our mosque. And I didn't know, and I, the mufti of, you know, like a great scholar sitting in front of me. And after Salah, he said, ask. And this is the grand mufti of Mecca. What kind of questions? You're like, and what was the first question asked to him? Sheikh, yes. How about meat? The halal meat. Are we allowed to eat meat here? Yani, the very famous question. You know what his answer was? This is the mufti of Mecca. You know what his answer was? He said, I don't know. I do not live here. You tell me. I cannot give you a fatwa because I don't live here. I don't know the situation. That tells you something. He knows the ayahs in the Quran, doesn't he? He knows the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He can quote it immediately. But no, what is your situation here? What is your condition here? I, do not, I don't know. To give you the fatwa, not only do I have to have a knowledge, but I have to know your situation practically. The implication of what I'm going to say on you. What's your situation here? If I do not have access to this, I'm not going to be quick to throw a fatwa. Some of us. If I was to ask this question to many people immediately, yes, it's halal, yes, it's haram, fast. Fast and giving a, a quick fatwa. I might have an opinion, but be very careful with what we say. Things, they really need study. So that's one extreme. The other extreme, which I'm, I'm actually more afraid from, is that people would say, subhanallah, now I understand, sharia has a purpose. That makes sense, brother. And now what they're going to do, they're going to take things in their own hands. Oh, you know, now I understand. I don't like this ruling because I live in the United States. Let's not do it. You know, and, and I warn from this. This is following one's desire. We spent one hour, the very first lecture, if you remember, about hawa. The danger of following one's hawa. It's not a joke. It is not easy. And I'll give you again a simple example to relate to. One of you might ask me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. And you might ask, you know, if, if I come uh, up here on the second floor and I drop something, right? Um, uh, how, how long will it take to fall? What is the time? And I tell you, yes, I know the rule. S equals half a t squared, half g t squared. Many of you can calculate this. Half g t squared. You can buy even a calculator, plug it in, right? The, the, the distance and the acceleration g, and you find the time. It's very simple, right? But here comes another brother, brother and says, oh, brother, I want to use this rule, but it's different now. I'm going to throw an object up. How long it's going to take till it comes? And tell him, oh, wait, the rule I gave you doesn't take the initial velocity into account. Modify the rule. S equals ut plus half gt squared. Uh, okay, thank you, brother. Right? And then another person comes. Now I have a different problem. It's a projectile. I'm not going to throw it in one dimension. I'm going to throw it like that with an angle. How far is it going to go? And tell him, okay, I, have, I, I can solve the problem for you. No problems, right? Another person might come with a different problem, a pendulum. You know, and how, what's the frequency? I, every single problem has what? A rule. But I can tell you, you know what? All those problems fall under one rule. I can tell you that rule and you can solve it for yourself. Really? Yes. What is it? F equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's it. That's the rule that I, by, by which I can solve how planets rotate around the sun, by which I can solve the core engine, by which I can solve the pendulum, by which I can solve any mechanical problem with this, this simple equation. Many of you say, hey, that's easy, right? So I beg to differ with you. Do you know how to solve this equation? First of all, F equals MA. A is the second derivative of X with respect to T. Also, derivative, differentiation, do you know calculus? Oh, you don't know calculus. So, if you want to solve this equation, and if you, if, you, if you want me to tell you how to solve it in one hour, that's not going to suffice, right? You'd better be willing to learn for a couple of months calculus first. And then when you learn calculus, differentiation, I surprise you, I tell you, you know what? What I told you is the derivative in one dimension. Many of the problems are three-dimensional, right? So now we need partial differentiation. And you need differential equations. And how to solve those? It's even more advanced. 
And people spend ages, time after time after time, how to take the equation and apply it. It is not easy. And that's in secular knowledge. Similarly, in our shara, it is no joke. If you expect that we're going to, through this class, I'm going to understand Sharia and I'm going to become a jurist, it's impossible. If I didn't even memorize Quran, if I didn't, I don't know hadith, the basics. I don't know the Arabic language. I don't know usul al-fiqh. If you really want to solve F equals MA, spend time. There is a way. And this is what, what I'm saying here. There is a way. It exists. If I'm really interested, put time. But without this knowledge, attempting to solve this equation by myself is a no-no. It's not a simple... And I'll give you a practical example now. We, and we will start from here this time. I mentioned the kuliyat al-khams, the five intents of sharia, right? That we want to... Sharia wants to protect the five. But which is more important? If I was to ask you now, just to give you some taste of it, uh, which is more important? Protecting religion or protecting life? Which one is more important? Religion, life, no, which, if, if you have to take a decision, life or religion. Those who say life have an argument. They tell you with no life, there is no religion, right? And yet the other group will tell you, but religion, life with no religion leads to what? Destruction in the hereafter. That's no life. You lived in this world, but life is more than this world. Remember what we said, the intent of Sharia is to bring the benefit for the servants, not only in this life, but in the hereafter as well. Something that's harmful in the hereafter must not be done. So which one is right? Which one is wrong? You see my... And the answer is, both are right and both can be wrong. I tricked you. I, I, the, the question has a trick. L let's explain further. Each one of those compartments, deen, life, uh, property, the scholars divide it into three categories. Let's take deen. They tell you, for example, religion to protect freedom of religion. They tell you, religion, there is three main things. Number one, al-daruri. Number two, al-haji. Number three, al-tahsini. Three categories. Number one, the absolute necessities. There are certain things in, in, under the category of religion that are absolutely necessary, without which there is no Islam. La ilaha illallah. As-salah. You know the main, the five, you do not jeopardize those. Those are the main, without those, it is necessary to establish religion to have Tawheed. Without Tawheed, there is no Islam. So that falls under the category of Daruri. You must have to have religion, right? For life, what's Daruri for life? Air, water, food. If I don't have this, there is no life whatsoever. So the first category is what? Daruri. The second category is what? Need. Something that, without which, it will be very hard. An example. Clothes. Can you live with no, no clothes? I can, but it's going to be very hard. Shelter. Can I live homeless? You will live. You will survive. It's not daruri. But your life will be very, very hard, right? So that's a needed thing. And you see the difference. Number one, you cannot live without daruri. Number two, needed. Without which there is extreme hardship on you. Number three, tahsini. Tahsini means what? Embellishment. Let's take an example. Again, religion. For example, la ilaha illallah, prayers, daruri. Extra dhikr, dua, needed, highly needed. Very hard to do, is, yani, to become a good Muslim without this. You can still do the five prayers without it, yes, but it's highly needed. What, what's a tahsini in religion? What's tahsini embellishment is to make beautiful. And look at our shara'ah. Our shara'ah is taking care of what? Making, making things beautiful. That's a part of sharia. What's an example of that? Wudu. Can I pray with no wudu? Well, wudu is a fard, right? You cannot pray with... And look at that. Not everything that's tahsini, embellishment, means it's not necessary. You need to make wudu before you pray. But on the other hand, if there is no water, is, is Islam gone? No. What do we do? We do tayammu. And you can still pray. So therefore, the matters of wudu, the matters of tahara is what? Tahsini. Now, answering the question I posed, if I tell you somebody is on an expedition or like uh, on a hike and he yani, became unclean, he needs to make ghusl to pray. And it's very cold. It's very cold to the extent that if he makes a ghusl in that cold weather, he might what? He might die. So what should he do? 
Now, do you understand the question? The question is, if he implements the rule of, of Islam in that case, to preserve the tahsini, the tahsini of religion, wudu is tahsini, he might lose his life completely. So a daruri in life precedes a tahsini in religion. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Something that's embellishment in the religion is lesser than something that's necessary for life. Do you get the concept? So when, when I asked this question, it was a trick question. Right? When I ask you which is more important, matters of deen or matters of life, our sharia says, well, what kind of matters of deen? Wudu versus a human life, human life is more important. You got this concept? So every branch of those three things, uh, out, uh, sorry, out, out of those five things, has three, three categories. Daruri, yeah, that which is essential, that which is needed, and that which is tahsini, embellishment. And one has to put the matters where they are before one makes, yani, which, which is on the expense of what, right? And the example I gave about wudu is indeed a shari law, and the story is in the hadith by Amr ibn al-As, when he was in an expedition, and he was junub, and he had to make ghusl, and the sahaba like, said, you have to make ghusl, and he said no. And he went, and you know what he did? Like in the dust, and, and when he came back, the prophet said, yes, this is correct. Because you would have died if you, if you did otherwise. Right? So th this is indeed a part of our sharia. So this is number one. Other things, the concept of, and I'll give examples about that, the concept of collective versus individual. Something that's harmful, um, individual harm for a person versus collective harm for a, a community, which one precedes the other. You see, it's very obvious, right? So whenever, we, whenever scholars would sit and do this legal analysis, they take that into account. Collective versus individual. Individual benefit versus collective harm. If there is harm and benefit, which one precedes? Scholars tell you, it's a shari law. Warding of harm precedes attracting benefits to, to us as humans. That's a shari law. Let me give you some examples, Yani, to, to, to see that in perspective. Uh, Ibn Ashur, the great scholar like by which the, the book Yani, we have here the scholar of Maqasid, if you will, in our times. He was in, in Tunis. And he was a scholar of Maqasid al-Sharia. And he wrote about it. And mashallah, very a great scholar in the Maliki fiqh, great scholar in tafsir of the Quran, everything. And he lived during the time of the French colonization of Algeria and Tunis. And you know the French. When the French comes in a place, unlike the British, you know what they did? They come and they tell you, this is France. The British, when they came to Egypt, they tell you, this is Egypt. You have your own king, right? And they play this game. The French, on the other hand, they come and tell you, there is nothing called Algeria. This is France, right? And you are French. And, and, and there is, of course, legal consequences of that, right? So they wanted a fatwa regarding something of that sort, which I don't want to go into the details. Like, they wanted the scholars to aid them, right? And they went to different, you know, schools of thought, the Hanafi school of thought, the Maliki school of thought, and it seems scholars did not agree. And then all of a sudden they announced that the great scholar Ibn Ashur agreed on, on what we said. And, the, and he says that it's okay. And they started to pr promote this, if you will, rumor. And Ibn Ashur is silent. And people got upset. Yes, what's happening there? Yani ruining his reputation. And, and there are some arguments. And, but Ibn Ashur is silent. No word whatsoever. And nobody understood what's going on. Was, was he really, did he really give this fatwa? And people were, oh, he's not a good scholar. He gave them this fatwa. He's not answering back. He's not saying anything. And it was doubtful, you know, question marks. Later on, the French left, right? And here comes Burqiba the, the, in Tunis a long time ago. And all of us know what Burqiba did. He went to Ibn Ashur and he said, you know, he's the scholar of Maqasid, right? The intent of Sharia. And he told him, you know what? Uh, we really need money. Yani, the country is in such a huge, disastrous economical situation. And Ramadan is coming, and the workers in the factories, when they fast, they don't produce enough. And we are in, a, in the midst of an economical crisis. Please, I want you to go and, yani, on, on the radio and tell them. Tell them not to fast. And you, you see, the, he's, he's playing what? Intent of Sharia. There is benefit, right? The benefit is what the economical situation we're in, there is the great disasters, and versus fasting, 
and you know it makes sense for me can you please coming from you people would listen right ibn ashur ibn ashur said okay he goes to the and this is yeah, everybody knows he goes and the in the public radio on air and he recites the ayah of siyam you know يا ايها الذين امنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون and then he says صدق الله وكذب برقيبة fast he said Allah said the truth and Burqiba is lying all of you should fast and people were like number one the issue of maqasid is no joke why did he do that let's understand fasting that's a pillar of Islam that's a, that's daruri in deen right and that's a ibadah that's not going to change economical economical damage is what probabilistic do you know for a fact that there is a an economic no it's a probable damage right so there is a probable damage in economy in property versus an essential of deen there is no way to do this fasting is there is no compromise in it now the interesting question that comes here is the following ibn ashur jeopardized his own life didn't he coming on air like this defying the authority and saying it he jeopardized his life but with the french he didn't say so later after he died the truth came what happened with the french you remember the french asked him to give a similar fatwa and he was silent he didn't come and say no they're wrong no do not obey them why uh, look to the mind of the jurist very simple go through what we just said for the case of the french right First of all, they asked a fatwa from him. Nobody of the people were following this fatwa, right? Yani, people are not following it. So him coming and saying, I didn't say that will, will not add any benefit. There is no benefit to people. But if he speaks, the benefit is for who? To clear his name, right? So the benefit really is my personal individual name. And he's, the, the scholar said, he perceived if I was to come on air and tell them that those French are lying on my behalf, things were so tense, people were so upset, they would go and revolt. And then the French people would shoot them. And there is probable, notice the word, probable death in people. So he weighed two things. The benefit is what? My personal benefit of honor and name on one side, if I speak. Nothing more, because people are not following this fatwa. Nobody's taking it seriously. And I didn't say it, and people don't believe it. It's just a rumor, number one. Number two, on the other hand, if I do go out and speak, there is a probable, not certain, a probable damage to the lives of many people. So you're weighing two things, an individual benefit to my honor versus a probable damage to the human life of people. Which one did he favor? You see what he did, right? They come first. When it was the opposite. In the second case, it was the opposite. If I speak on the air, right, my life might be jeopardized. I might lose my life. And here it's probable. Probable loss of life, not certain. Versus if I don't speak or if I say what he said, a certain damage in religion. So he favored what? Do you see how this is working? It is not about my name and I'm, I'm the most courageous guy, I always speak. There is intent. And oftentimes we miss this. In the Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi al Munkar. Indeed, I should stand up and speak the truth. If the harm is coming to me, is one thing. Al Izz ibn Abdul Salam, which is a great scholar, a great scholar of, of Maqasid al Sharia, he was that way. He would stand and speak the truth. And it, would, it might cost him his own life. But nowadays, sometimes, when we stand and speak the truth, it's not about my life. It is about the lives of other, other people. Other people are going, you have to be very careful. I can be strict with me. Alhamdulillah. I can follow a strict path when I'm paying for the consequences. But when it's for other people, maqsad al at taysir I have to be very careful. I must not jeopardize others. I want to stand up and speak against some person from Israel. Well, well, you have to weigh two things. If you speak, you speak out, what's the benefit? Is there a probable damage that this masjid must, may close? If the answer is yes, don't do it. And that's, that's not, not my opinion. But I, I want you to see this, that one has, has to measure things. It's not about me alone. 
I represent specifically, I represent a society. If I re be very careful. The damage that I, I, I might do by my words, I have, to be I have to weigh that carefully. The example of Ibn Ashur is very obvious in that. Right? Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, if you want يعني, more examples I can give you, like Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam is, is a great example. Again, Maqasid al-Shari'ah. Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, when the Mongols were invading Egypt, and the, they, they were telling him, you know what, we don't have any money. No money. يعني, and, and we need to prepare an army. Allow us to take taxes from people. Taking taxes, taxing people like what we, is not allowed in Sharia. Many people don't, do you understand this? There are benefits in Sharia. Imagine if, if, imagine if you tell people that if you implement Sharia, there is 0% taxes. There is other ways to take money, not, not taxing people that way, 40%, that's unfair. It's not fair. It's not allowed. So he, in this condition, they went to al ibn Abd al-Salam and told him, look, this is a new situation. We, there is a new situation here that we need, we need a fatwa. I, uh, this, the, the ruler Qutuz was saying, I know it is not allowed, but the Mongols are attacking and they already invaded most of the Muslim world and Egypt is the last stand. We don't have money. I need money. I need to tax people to, to get money so I can prepare the army. Give me a fatwa. Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam fatwa and look at that using the concept of Maqasid al-Sharia. He said only under one condition. First, you take the wealth that you have and the rich among you, those Mamalik of Egypt, the rich people, you should take from their wealth first. Don't take from the poor. And keep taking from their wealth till their level becomes lower and lower and lower till they equal the people. Then if that happens and you still need money, then you're allowed to tax everyone equally. And when he did that, subhanAllah, when he took the wealth from the rich people till they, the money sufficed. And that's again, uh, that's a new rule, that's a new fatwa, that's something that wasn't present in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But al Izz ibn Abd al-Salam was able to do that. The scholar al Izz ibn Abd al-Salam again speaking up, you all know what he did. When he went to Egypt, and he was the, the jurist of Egypt, Al-Qadi, and he noticed the Mamalik of Egypt. I don't know if you know what the Mamalik is. Those are people that... Uh, 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 the followers of Salah al-Din al-Ayyub used to buy slaves, unlike the concept of slaves in the West. They used to buy slaves and do what? Educate them, teach them Quran, teach them Sunnah, teach them Fiqh, and then teach them martial arts, teach them the, basically spend on them so that they are the best warriors ever. All the arts you know, of military, and of course spend on them so that they're educated in terms of religion and they have reverence of religion. And then they would gather those slaves and they're not... They're now a very powerful force, and they had such a status in society. Can you imagine slaves? It ended up that those slaves ruled Egypt, by the way, as you all know. But they had such a powerful status in the society. They walk on the street, they're the commanders, the rulers. Nobody can stand, and, and al ibn Abd al-Salam, being the jurist, he noticed something, well, well, well. You bought them from the money of the treasury. You bought those slaves, originally, from the money of the people. They're doing some financial transactions, without going into details, that slaves cannot do. They're acting as if they're free. And legally, in Sharia perspective, that's not allowed. So what do you propose? He said, I propose the following. All of them, since they belong to the treasury, they belong to the people, they don't belong to you or anyone, I'll take them and I'll go out in the public and I'll offer them for sale in front of everyone. So you'll take the head of the, you know, the army, put him up there and tell people, who would buy him? Who would buy him $10, $10, $20, right? And then if, if, if I sell him and I take the money, he can be free. And when, of course, when the Mamalik heard that, they were furious. How dare he wants to sell me in public? You know, what, what, what humiliation. And one of them took his sword and decided, that's it. Where, where is this Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam? Who dares to speak like this? And notice his yani, power. And he took his sword, and this is a martial arts yani, expert, right? And wearing his armor and things, and the soldiers behind him, and took his sword and went to the, to the house of Al-Izz ibn Abd al -Salam. He knocks the door, and you can imagine. The son of Al-Izz ibn Abd al opens the door, and he finds this Mamluk strong with the sword, angry. He was terrified. He runs inside and tells his father, oh, my father, my... You know, he's out there, this Mamluk, and like, and he has a sword. 
right? And he's terrified. He's going to kill you. There is, that's it. Uh, nobody can stop him at all. Ta'iz ibn Abdul Salam looked to his son, and you know what he told him? He told him, oh, my son, your father did not reach that level that Allah would honor him with dying in that way. Don't worry. I'm not on that level. He's not going to kill me because I didn't reach that state yet. So don't worry. That won't happen. And he walks. And he walks to that person and he stands in front of him. He didn't speak. He said, yes, I'm Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam. He looks to him. It is said that person started to shake. The sword dropped from his hand, started kissing the hand of Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam and he told him, whatever you want. And that's what happened. Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam sold them one by one and when he was selling them, the ruler of Egypt yani, had to interfere. So when he says $10, the ruler of Egypt say $10,000 here, set him free. You know, to, to, suffice, to suffice them the agony of it. But this tells you what? That Maqasid al-Sharia is not about jeopardizing this deen. Scholars that spoke about Maqasid al-Sharia were not apologetic scholars, as many of us think. So one has to be warned. Nevertheless, Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, in doing this, didn't jeopardize the lives of others, did he? When he did this fatwa, when he spoke out against the, the oppressive ruler, who's he jeopardizing? People? No, he's jeopardizing himself. I want you to be very clear on that. There is a big difference between speaking for the truth and my life is in jeopardy. That's highly recommended by the Prophet Afdal al-Jihad, kalimat haqq, fuwajhi sultan in jair But speaking and jeopardizing other Muslims that's a very different category from a Maqasid perspective. One has to be very careful. So, so I, I hope that's yani, clear in, uh, in our mind. So, in favoring uh, uh, yani, uh, when masalih and mafasid, if harms and benefits are contradicting, how do I favor? We said three things. Number one, darura versus yani, necessity versus need versus embellishment. That has to be taken into account. Right? If something is equal, religion is before life, the, the order I said, right? But one has to be careful with what? What category it is. Necessity is different than embellishment. We don't jeopardize any necessity, any necessity precedes an embellishment. A necessity of protecting the wealth of Muslims precedes an embellishment in religion. That's a shari law in general. That's a well-known established thing among, among the jurists. So that's number one. Number two, the concept of probability. That a scholar must take into account what? Probable. Probable versus certain. And we sp they speak like that, they call it al-ma'alat. When, whenever we take a decision, you, you, we have to study the probability. What's the probability of harm? Is it high or is it low? How much is it? That's a part of it. The concept. And number three, collective versus individual. This is, yani, Let's take one more example and I'll switch to the more, a little bit more important topic. Let's take khamr, the issue of drinking wine, for example. Well, khamr, and notice the word in the Quran. You know what khamr means? You know khimar? A woman wears a khimar, a veil. Allah calls wine khamr. Why? It veils your mind. We call it wine, but its real name is an intoxicant. It's a veil, something ugly, something bad. Well. Uh, is it good or is it bad? What do we know? Many times we speak to people about khamr and they tell us what? Well, 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 there is a recent study in France that proved that drinking a cup of wine every day is good for you. Is that correct or wrong? Is that right or wrong? It's right. And the, most of us try, no, 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 khamr is all bad. That's not correct. As a matter of fact, the correct answer, one can say, I already know that 1400 years ago. Of course, there is benefit in khamr. Who said so? Allah said so. Where? In the Quran. Yes, alunak an al khamri wal maisir. They ask you about wine and gambling. What did Allah say regarding them? Qul fi huma ithmun kabir. In them is yani, great negativity and great harm. There is ugliness in them indeed. And manafi' al nas and benefit for mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues the ayah, وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا And their harm is much greater than their benefit. So that's an example in the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing an issue, the issue of khamr. There is, yes, there is benefit in it. There is some benefit. 
Indeed, there is. I mean, we're not denying that. But there is harm. And the question becomes, of, uh, the Shari question is, which is higher? When we have something of some benefit and some harm, we have to look on them. If you take statistics, and the, the, the concept here is important, if you just take statistics about what happens as a result of drinking wine even in this society, it is obvious this is a complete disaster. I, I just mentioned some 33,000 people die every year as a result of what? Drunk driving. So can you imagine somebody killing 30,000 Americans? What will happen to a country that does this? Gone, right? Bombed. 30,000 people die every year, die as a result of that. 500,000 people are injured only from car driving. Half a million every year as a result of people drinking while driving. There are 1.4 million people arrested doing this. Yani arrested before harming anyone. 1.4 million every year. The cost in dollars, now the harms in terms of finances, every year, 114 billion dollars. 114 billion dollars as a result of, isn't that, isn't that harm? Yes, that's, that's, that, and that's harm to an individual? No, it's collateral, it's to the society. Right, so that has to be weighed. Now speaking about the matter of honor, women that are being attacked, 50% of those people that attack the honor of women out, out there are using alcohol. Indeed, alcohol is something that wipes your mind. You want the number? 900 women every day is being yani, attacked in her honor as a result of people drinking. 900 every day? Isn't that enough to stop it? Really? Isn't that enough harm? But yet we continue. Uh, in, 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 we know in campuses, the, the calamities that befall girls and boys, you know, being drunk in the casino at night and they don't remember what happened, 60% of women get STD as a result of using alcohol and ending up in a relation that's not, you know, and she doesn't remember what happened. Isn't that damage? That's tremendous damage. So in, from a, a Quranic perspective, from an Islamic perspective, one should say, okay, I put this damage, all this damage on one side. Not to mention abuse, not to mention, yeah, if I start uh, assaults, those are by the millions, by the way. Like, uh, if, uh, if I remember correctly, the statistics, four million cases of assaults, you know, people beating each other up and, and sometimes injuries, in, like in hospital, four million every year as a result of being, people being drunk. Because you end up doing those kind of things. This is great damage. One might say, but I drink responsibly. Brother, like, I drink responsibly. Here we have to understand now the concept of what? Very simple. The, and it's, it's a, even a concept of uh, jurisprudence and law nowadays. Stop signs outside. Why do you have stop signs? If you have a transaction, or sorry, if you have a, a crossroad, and I tell you 10% of the time there is accident. It's, you know, cars are crashing. So what will the state do? They will come and put a stop sign, right, on both sides. The stop sign is very, a person like me, it's very annoying. It's night time, there is a stop sign, and yet I have to stop. It's very annoying, and I can tell you, but I drive responsibly. I know myself. I drive responsibly. Well, laws cannot be legislated based on an individual. I know you do, but it is not about you. There is only 10% of the people that drive irresponsibly. That's enough. 10% accidents? If you, can you imagine 10%? 10%, yani every 100 cars, 10 cars crash. Isn't that enough to put stop signs? What do you mean? 90% of the people don't need it. 90% of the people will be what? Annoyed, right? You have to stop unnecessary. But for 10%, we have to do it. Did you get this concept? When we legislate laws, I cannot legislate law in a way, only for the 10% they have to stop while the 90 It won't work because I say I'm from the 90% and I will drive. You understand the concept? So when we legislate law, I know. A person might tell me, but I drink responsibly. I tell him you have two problems. Number one, those people that speak that way, those people that did those acts, do you think they intended to drink to, to kill? No. They all said what you said. They all were saying, I drink responsibly. But a human soul is weak. You have an Fs. You have a self. You have an ego. How can you trust yourself that much? Do not trust yourself that much. In a point of weakness in your life, if 
Wine is present in an environment. You might end up being one of those people. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So one, you, I cannot trust you. This is number one. Number two, even if you're a decent guy and trustworthy and honorable, but what can I do? I can, a law is a law. A law is only a law if everybody obeys it. Right? I put a stop sign there. Everybody must stop. Every single person. Right? So similarly, from an Islamic perspective, I see the damage of Khamr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this kind of damage is tremendous. And all what I said is in, in this life. Can you imagine the damage in the hereafter? How many people are alcoholics, addicts, and what it does to their life? And what does it do to the relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Destructive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is really destructive. It is really dangerous to leave it to human beings. Tell them drink responsibly. Because many of them won't. And when they don't, not only will they harm themselves, they harm others. So the general rule for the benefit of mankind is what? It has to be completely prohibited. Some people would say, but it's unfair for me. I know it's unfair for you, but for the well-being of the society, this has to be implemented. Your individual benefit versus collateral damage. You get the, this, and we have that in law. If a person steals in the United States, is the penalty death? No, right? If a person steals, do you kill him? No. What happens in martial law? An earthquake happens in Irvine, you know, the electricity is out, they declare martial law. If a person is caught stealing, what's, what's, what's the penalty? Shoot. Why? Is that fair to that person? It's not fair to that person. But what, are, what is the rule? What is the law weighing? I know it is unfair to one individual. But on the other side is what? Public safety. And yes, indeed, we will take the life of one individual for the benefit of the public safety. That's even in, in secular law, right? So similarly, as a Muslim, I understand that some people, oh, I drink responsibly. But the society, for the benefit of society, that has to be banned. And therefore, khamra in Islam is what? Not allowed at all. Now, when something is not allowed and something is very dangerous, how can I enforce it? Stop signs. They put stop signs so we decrease accidents. The first thing a person like me would do if I was not driving any properly, I see a stop sign, what do I do? I speed. Who cares? Pass it. I won't respect it. Do we see that? Yes. People sometimes don't respect laws, right? What can I do to make people respect law? What if I pass a stop sign? The concept of what? There has to be penalty. Right? You understand the concept? Penalty. Had. Why, why I pass a stop sign? And by mistake, I'm a good driver. I'm usually a good driver and I'm driving one time, I didn't see it. Slipped. And I passed it. And there is a cop there and he stops me. Violation. $250. $250? I, I never did this before. Wallah, it was a mistake. I always drive good. What is he going to say? You have to pay it. Why? Is your intent to penalize me? Are you torturing me? Is that the intent of... Why did we put $250? What if we put only $1? What will happen? People are going to take it like what? Lightly. The penalty, the reason sometimes the penalty is increased is what? To deter people. To make money, that's a <laughs> another purpose for different system. But in, the, in, in our case, the main intent is what? To deter people. The higher the crime, the higher the penalty. Drunk driving, what happens? If you're caught drunk and driving, it's going to be $50? This is higher, right? Uh, speeding, maybe a little bit lower. 10, you know, 10 miles off speed limit, okay, that's... So the, in, the, the extent of the penalty has to do with what? How much I want to deter people from doing that. Is that concept clear? I'll stop with one story because we we're out of time and we'll pick now. This introduces the concept of hudud. The concept of uh, penalties in Islam. Penal law. Why penal law? What is the intent of penal law in Islam? We, we'll start there next time, but I'll finish with one thing. Uh, a man came once to uh, a scholar and he told him the following. You know, I'm, I have a big problem. And, and it was an emir. You know, a, a person who's very rich, a prince. What happened, it was Ramadan, and uh, you know, I had some relation with my wife, so my, my fasting is violated. What should I do? And the Quran, you know, you know what I'm speaking about, right? In Ramadan, we cannot have marital relation. And this person was a great prince with 
ما شاء الله lot of wealth committed this and he, he violated his fast so he is going for this فقيه what, what's the fatwa and we all know the fatwa in the Quran and in the sunnah right so he told him the following he said well well you're a prince right if I tell you feed hungry people it's nothing right if I tell you free slaves it's nothing so for you you'd better fast 60 days you understand what he did so people were like really impressed oh that scholar he understands maqasid very well he really punished him, right? Because for him, telling him to feed 60 people, he'll be like, okay, here, tomorrow, same thing, right? It won't work. And he wasn't happy. So he went to another sheikh. And he sheikh, I did this and this. And he free slaves, feed 60 people. And he said, really? But the other scholar, he said, no, 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 go ahead. Feed 60 people or free a slave, go ahead. And he was so happy. And people were so upset. Yeah, sheikh, what did you do? This is an emir. This is nothing for him. The other scholar is the one that understands. He's the one that he really gave it to him. You, what did you do? And he said, Subhanallah. All what was in your mind is what? To punish this Amir. What was in my mind is to benefit the Muslims. Let him do it every day. We'll feed 60 people every day. Let him do it every day. We'll free a slave every day. What's wrong with you? And that's the mindset of most of us. Most of us are of type A. Punish him. Let's, let's revenge. Right? And that's not the purpose of had. It's not only to punish the perpetrator. You know, it's not about avenging. There is the hereafter, by the way. There is the hereafter. Nobody's going to escape anything. Right? So the purpose of hudud, why are they, why are they legislated? We'll start that next time. We'll speak about maybe had al-sariqa and some other hudud, inshallah. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله كل خير